Hello and welcome. This is one of those companies which is a little bit of an enigma in the life sciences and healthcare space. Well, we've got an opportunity to understand Reliance Life Sciences uh, and what they do and the kind of product offerings they have and the research that they're doing in the areas in which they're doing it. I'm now joined by KV Subramaniam, President and Chief Executive Officer of Reliance Life Sciences to understand this a little better. Mr. Subramaniam, thank you very much for speaking with us. So you're a relatively new player in the area of biotechnology products and uh, you know more specifically human plasma protein products and biosimilars. What's that market looking like to you uh, in the Indian context and what's helping it grow or not? Okay, we are about uh, no, 11 years old in this industry. We are probably the youngest player in this space. Uh, if you look at both the pharma as well as the biotechnology companies. Uh, when we started off, we started looking at the larger opportunities. And these were two areas that appealed to us because we were very clear from the beginning that we wanted to have highly differentiated products catering to very critical or unmet uh, medical needs. So it struck us that there was nobody in the plasma proteins industry. Uh, it was all coming in through multinational companies selling in India or traders in the country. And coming from a traditional uh, petrochemical background where we realized that uh, the potential in India is quite a lot. And that potential can be realized if you have a domestic manufacturer uh, supplier uh, who keeps prices consistent and is there for the long term then the potential grows right. so there were some WHO uh, statistics saying that India's potential for about close to a million liters of plasma equivalent in terms mm -hmm. of plasma protein products well, one of those applications is to prevent blood clotting that's among that's one of them but yeah. uh, okay let me give you a quick uh, wrap up on that the largest product is albumin is primarily used in patients with shock mm -hmm. liver diseases mm -hmm. you know, cirrhosis and things like that the next largest one is the immuno immunoglobulin which is essentially used by patients who have immunological issues right. deficiencies and so on and then the uh, factor 8 concentrates derived from plasma proteins are primarily used for people with uh, uh, clotting disorders, mm -hmm. uh, hemophilia, mm -hmm. right. and there are a number of other smaller specialty plasma proteins. Uh, so if you take one bottle of blood transfusion, you know, one bottle actually meets one patient, whereas mm -hmm. when you separate them into the components, the, uh, the proteins, then you can use that for multiple right. patients. So this opportunity appealed to us, uh, and then we got into it, and many times when you don't know something, mm -hmm. then you venture it, mm -hmm. uh, then you start learning. Uh, it always struck us why the industry in India did not focus on this area and we are discovering new areas of opportunities also. So we got into it and coming from a traditional manufacturing mindset, we decided that we will invest in manufacturing because that is what gives you a long term presence, a commitment to this country and will give you scale. Mm -hmm. So we learned the hard way, this is an area where unlike other small molecule products, they Raw material is a very significant part of the total cost. Raw material supplies are uh, highly constrained. Uh, so we got into it and then soon we found that this is something that can be scalable. So what are your key raw materials and where so do they come we from? we basically get uh, uh, blood plasma. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it comes from India. Mm -hmm. Some part of it, very small, comes from outside the country, US primarily. But a good part of what we use are what are called fractions. So mm -hmm. you take blood plasma, you fractionate, you get to the fractions and you do the purification fill finish. So we also get the intermediate fractions for various fraction 5, so albumin mm -hmm. fraction 2, fibrinoglobin and so on. Cryoprecipitate is for the uh, anti-clotting factors and so on. Uh, so we got them imported and fortunately we were able to tie up with uh, some good uh, sourcing partners which is very critical in this business. And then we s started seeing scale and earlier it was on an opportunistic basis, uh, even though to some extent the other competitors do it on an opportunistic basis. So if a multinational company has surplus, they would push it into mm. India or some trader sees an opportunity would import and sell. But we came and kind of stabilized the market, kept the prices, our MRP was in the lowest uh, in the albumin market and same with immunoglobulin. So when we kept prices constant, steady, the market grew and then you need a lot of, lot of promotion also because many doctors were to get used to the idea of uh, using plasma proteins as against a complete blood uh, therapy. Mm. So that's been the kind of uh, history of uh, this area. And as far as biosimilars are concerned, we again being focusing on the biological side, we realized this is another area we saw the world in the future. We didn't have that kind of a foresight, but mm -hmm. we said, okay, this is going to be a new area. 
And so we started focusing on all the biosimilar programs. So what have been your two most successful biosimilars, which I assume are products or innovation, I mean, you're innovating on products that have been left off or dropped off the radar somewhere. Right, so uh, I wouldn't say that any one or two product of biosimilars is still successful. We are still at very early stages in terms of tapping the opportunity. Right now we are the largest number of biosimilars in the Indian market in numbers. Mm -hmm. But since we are not in insulin, we don't have that right. revenue profile wise, we are not there. But I think we have the largest uh, number of biosimilars under development in the industry on a global basis. Mm -hmm. Right now we are working on 29 biosimilars, 8 of them are in the market, 7 are under clinical development, the others are in the way. It's a long pathway. Uh, and then we're working on additional biosimilars also. Idea is to build a very strong portfolio of biosimilars. So initially we had the first generation biosimilars, the erythropoietins, the GCSF. Now, we, uh, a couple of months back, we introduced uh, the first monoclonal antibody, uh, uh, Apsiximab, which is used to prevent platelet agglomeration and uh, angioplasty. We have monoclonal antibodies for anti-cancer therapy in clinical development. So, uh, idea is that we want to have differentiated. So are are ma many of your biosimilars related to cardiovascular diseases? Apsiximab, yes, mm. that is cardiovascular. The others are all, uh, one more is uh, cardiovascular, that is tissue plasminogen activator. Mm. That's used for patients in the golden hour who have a mm. cardiac infarct. And that's a clot, also, no, also known as a clot buster. And then we have most of them coming now are going to be oncology and uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, focused. Uh, so you're saying the of the 29 products that you spoke of, so it's cardiovascular, on oncology, and rheumatoid, rheumatoid uh, arthritis. arthritis. Is, these are the three yeah, areas yeah. that you're addressing. And an odd product here for asthma and things like that. Right. right. So these three areas uh, are because you feel that these are areas which would be otherwise uh, unaddressed by other pharmaceutical companies and their products? Or no, I don't think growing we, didn't as a we didn't come from that school of thought. We said we will do products and see what makes sense, those we will scale up and mm -hmm. we were not driven by saying I need to focus on ABC domain. Mm -hmm. But now it is coming to our realization that we need to focus on a few areas. Mm -hmm. Gastroenterology which was always there with the albumin. We are focusing on all neurology related uh, mm -hmm. areas, oncology, cardiology and we are also considering uh, CNS disorders. Mm -hmm. Also keeping in mind the changes in the social uh, context mm -hmm. that will happen. Uh, that's also what is driving us in terms of right. the domain focus. So th let me ask you that question then. W what is your uh, sense on which way uh, uh, patient consumption or patient needs will go in the next couple of years and how would you be responding to that? So some of the existing mm. areas, you have the classical diabetes or cardiology mm. which is much talked about. Those opportunities will become bigger. But there are a lot of uh, potentially new areas. If you take CNS drugs, you know, as there is more tension in, in the social fabric <laughs> is stress and a lot of sociological changes that you're mm. seeing. Uh, people having, you know, shorter fuses as far as the careers are concerned, nuclearization of families, all this is going to create increased stress levels. Yeah. And, and you're saying this not anecdotally, you're saying this because you see a direct correlation. Trends, yeah, okay. at the trends. Uh, you see it in the family also. Right. That, uh, more, you know, many youngsters want to look thin, they starve <laughs> and they get into, you know, all kinds of uh, mm. psychological disorders, eating disorders and so on. So that's one area. And there are a lot of unmet medical needs. Uh, we particularly focus on that. It's a very sm small part of what we do, but we see a lot of opportunities. We got into regenerative medicine early on, stem cells and tissue engineering. Mm. It was probably the hardest, first of all, starting from research was the hardest end mm. to start. On top of that, we got into stem cells. <coughs> now and we and are you're quite active in the hospital circuit, as I understand. Yeah. We want to be fairly focused on the hospital setup, particularly mm. in critical care situations. Mm. And that's what is giving us uh, a differentiation, and it also has entry barriers. And the bi biological themselves have entry barriers, but being focused on the hospital critical care, it gives you even more responsibility and even more, uh, mm. you know, the field is not very large. Uh, so, so saying unmet, medicine. Yeah. yeah, unmet. There are a number of things. We have a, a clinical trial uh, for uh, pigmentation disorders, uh, vitiligo, as, as it's called. It's a peculiar problem in India. Beta thalassemia. We do a lot of cord blood transplants for beta thalassemia. We probably only company, and we have the highest number of cord blood transplants mm -hmm. for hematological disorders. Or we have, we have a number of uh, clinical trial. Uh, 
are under uh, approval process. It's been stuck for quite some time, but now I think the regulators are trying to find a way out. Ischemic limb disease, uh, diabetic and venous ulcers. There are good solutions from the regenerative medicine area. Mm. Uh, so these are the kind of things, acute yeah. kidney injury, uh, Parkinson's disease, number of these areas. And we, we're really looking forward to getting approval for running those clinical trials because it's a completely different uh, school of medicine. It's a completely new approach to resolving some of these unmet needs. Mm. Uh, the other area we started working on is uh, wound management. Mm -hmm. This typically I think many companies didn't focus on this because the margins are very thin but I think there is a dire need. If you look at the burn, burn patients, it's a big opportunity mm. but the margins are very small. Uh, mm. Doctors struggle with kind of uh, options that they have uh, and if you visit some of these burn words, it's some of the most pathetic kind of uh, things that you see. It's a prolonged kind of stay and treatment and uh, unfortunately in our country, somebody with say 30, 40 percent burns, beyond that it's invariably they have some issue leading to their death, whereas in advanced countries even somebody with 90, 95 percent burns are able to treat them well. Of course then they go through a long right. process of uh, rehabilitation, a lot of plastic surgery and things like that. So we are working on a number of biopolymer based advanced wound management solutions or some of the plasma protein impregnated with uh, uh, thrombin impregnated with uh, biopolymers for wound management solutions. So that's another area that we are focusing on. Uh, so it's it gives us a start, the plasma protein, the biosimilars, but we constantly need to think ahead of the curve and get actively engaged in some of the other areas where either it is an unmet need or we think that from a patient standpoint, the disease is very much there. There are other solutions, mm -hmm. but they are not the effective solutions. Right. So, so last question, I'm sure many people ask you this, so what's a chemical engineer doing uh, manufacturing pharmaceuticals and even coming up with intuitive solutions for some of the problems that you've just talked about? No, I did my chemical engineering, I went to business school in I am Ahmedabad, uh, I had the fortune of working in uh, large organizations, a lot of uh, work in the area, apart from the grounding mm -hmm. that I've had in marketing or in projects and uh, a lot of time I have spent on corporate planning and corporate business development. And the advantage probably I had, uh, don't get shocked when I say this, but I was never a student of biology, but in the last <laughs> 11 years, I have learned yeah. a lot of biology, yeah. primary interactions, a lot of reading, and the challenge of, uh, so even in Reliance, it's now 20 years in Reliance, before that 14 years has to work for Indian Petrochemical, which is now part of yeah. Reliance. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <coughs> I've been involved in a lot of uh, new initiatives. This one was fairly exciting. Uh, so it was building something from scratch by, was by, by itself a challenge. But I find that I can ask all the stupid questions in the room. Uh, some of my colleagues may not be able to ask because they already come from that background. Mm -hmm. It helps clear my mind, probably it helps clear some of their mind. But you learn and then you start looking at it from a different way. Because many times we are conditioned to think in a certain way based on our uh, bringing education or exposure and so on. But when you look at it, things in a different way, so the constantly I tell them, please look at it differently, look at all the different angles, step back from what you're doing, be dispassionate and see how this should play out. I think that's important in terms of uh, looking at where the opportunities are. On hindsight, something might be right or wrong, but I don't think you should look back at the decisions you have taken. Right, uh, Mr. Subramanian, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you.